And now our third stop is who can apply? And I think we've had a lot of questions about this already. So back with uh, Sarin and Alexandre. And my first question is to you, Sarin. Which organization can be partners in projects? All right. So the, I'll talk about the types of organizations that are, uh, we are seeking uh, to, be, to be part of projects. So involving a variety of partner type, types enhances the potential impact of projects, both on the territories and on citizens. Therefore, the program encourages the uh, involvement of a wide range of uh, organizations that can contribute to projects, but they're also affected by projects. And, uh, this, uh, and these organizations need to come from different uh, segments of society. And I've listed the target groups that we are looking for on the slide here. Um, this is known as a quadruple helix. So you might find the reference to this quadruple helix in the NWE program document which we highly encourage uh, applicants to read before applying to our program. So because the program identifies specific target groups per priority and per specific objective. So while here I have listed the high level groupings, if you look in this document that I referred to, you can actually see specific examples of types of organizations we are looking for, for each specific objective. And, um, and so private and public actors coming from government, public authorities, the research sector, SMEs and business support organizations, as well as sectoral associations, NGOs, lobby organizations and citizen groups are highly encouraged to join partnerships. Now that being said, the quadruple helix principle, it is important, but it is not uh, mandatory for projects to have all four partner types represented in each project. Projects should set up their partnerships in line with their needs. That means in line with the project objectives and the expected results. So there should be coherence between these two things. And um, another thing to consider is that it is also not necessary that all four uh, types of partners have the same level of involvement in a given project. So you could have a, a situation where a project is led by two types of organizations, where the other two have more of a supporting role, a limited role. Maybe they're involved for a shorter period of time with a smaller budget for a very specific task. And furthermore, as Alexandre will explain later on, there's also the concept of associated organizations who are uh, essentially observers. That's also a way to involve an additional type of um, target group in projects. So we know which organizations can be partners in a project. Now the famous question about the countries which can take part in the program. Alexandre. Um, yeah, for, from a geographical point of view, uh, there's three important things uh, to keep in mind, which are also eligibility criteria. So this is really important and a real starting point, especially in step one. We're going to need three partners, a minimum of three partners from three different countries. This is the minimum needed for, to compose a partnership, but obviously um, consortiums can go, can go further. We often get the question, perhaps Peter has it on his computer already, which is what is the ideal size of a partnership? Um, but our answer is always the same. We cannot give a number. There is no ideal size of a partnership. The ideal size is the one that corresponds to the needs of your, of your project, the needs in relation to the objective that is set for the project. Just maybe one thing to keep in mind is that a very large partnership can become a little bit difficult to manage uh, coordination-wise from an administrative financial point of view. Then the second point is that at least two of these partners must be from the Northwest Europe area. Mm -hmm. So that means Ireland, Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, Switzerland, or the concerned parts of Germany and France. And then partners outside the NWE area we had the question already, um, and I answered, yes, they can join if they are well justified, meaning if the competences that the partnership is looking for cannot be found within the Northwest Europe area. Then concerning the roles, yeah, thanks. Um, they're the same as in the previous program, lead partner. We are still applying the lead mm -hmm. partner principle, meaning that one partner has to act as the lead partner. He's going to be in cooperation with the other particularly in charge of drafting uh, the application form and submitting it. Uh, and he will later on, if the project is approved, be the main, um, the main uh, contact person for uh, the JS and for the program bodies more generally. One important thing to keep in mind is that the lead partner must be an organization which is um, public or nonprofit. Then project partner, they're the ones which will contribute to the delivery of the projects. Uh, as Sarin just mentioned, 
one thing to keep in mind is that they can be, there's different levels of involvement which are possible. Um, and partners, being a project partner does not mean you need to be involved in all the aspects of, of a work plan. The involvement can be on just one work package or on with a limited scope of work, uh, a limited budget, et cetera, et cetera. And then finally, associate organizations. Uh, I was mentioning them also in relation to how the UK organizations can be involved. Associate organizations, previously called associate partners, they're entities which do not receive ERDF. They do not need to financially contribute to the project, but they, might, they can have an interest in the results or they can be interesting for the project partnership to uh, disseminate the information further. So, um, so it's, it's always interesting to um, identify some organizations that can, can play this role too, especially with our focus on dissemination rollout, um, et cetera, as was mentioned previously. All right, so the key question of eligibility, and I am sure we have some reactions from the audience, Peter. Indeed we do, um, of course. So um, this one is going to directly relate to what you were just speaking about, Alexandre. Um, and this is in the new Interreg Northwest Europe program, can partners um, in projects have sub-partners and associated partners? Um, so sub-partners being beneficiaries from the grant and associated partners without financing. So just maybe to All right. um, elaborate um, So again. clarify the difference maybe between associ associated partners and sub-partners and uh, which of these two can be involved in the new program? Well, as was mentioned, so associate organizations, they can be involved. Subpartners, they've been removed from uh, the program in 2021, 2027. So it is not possible to, have, to be a subpartner anymore. However, um, one thing which is important, as, as we both said, is that um, we have simplified a lot of processes and procedure in, in the way, um, especially projects and partners will have to report, do their reporting. So to that extent, with the limited involvement, with this simplification, um, the, 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 the rationale which led us to have this category of subpartner is maybe less necessary in, in this new program period. And that's what also led us to not keep this, uh, this category. All right, Peter, anything else? Yes, um, I have one question that keeps coming again is, can consulting and management companies be part of a consortium? Um, in, in addition, can consulting companies be in the lead when applying for funding? All right, so the role of uh, consultants and managing companies in a partnership. Who wants to take it? I can Sorry. take it. So it's very clearly stated in the program manual that uh, consultants cannot be partners in NWE projects. Uh, they may have a role supporting the lead partner or any other partner within the partnership, provided that they abide by procurement rules and they are, everything is in order in terms of uh, how they were selected to provide this support as external experts uh, to the project. All right, that's an answer for you, Wanda, and everyone else. Read the program manual, it's all in there. Peter. Um, so just one last question, I guess, um, before we wrap this part up is, um, can we build projects with two priorities overlapping? Mm. <laughs> I, what do we say? Um, <laughs> no, um, can we, no, no, this is um, having, if I understand the question well, uh, is it can a project, the same project, be applying in two different priorities? No, that's not possible. You have to, to uh, correspond to one priority and within that priority, one specific objective. And this has, if Sorry, I, yeah. this Go ahead. To, the specific priority that a project will contribute to must be chosen at the very beginning of a step one application form, and it remains valid throughout the entire um, application and implementation phase. Projects will be judged on their contribution to the specific objective, so to the territorial challenges identified, to the objectives that the program has set out to achieve and how the projects contribute to it. And one other thing to consider as applicants is that if you are unsure which priority to go to, think about your project and what it's trying to achieve and try to see if what you're trying to achieve is addressing a specific challenge as identified for a specific priority and a specific objective of the program. So try to find the best fit for you and make sure you are very clear about this because it's very important for us to know what projects are trying to achieve. Alexandre, yeah. go ahead. And if I just, just add, uh, Valérie was mentioning that the contact points had helped her very much in. Uh, in drafting and in, in, in the development phase of her project. And again, if you have, have a hesitation between two priorities, between different SOs, uh, one of the main places where you can get help is to get in touch with your contact points who can really help you to find the right SO. 
Yes, Ray, we will talk more about the role of contact points towards the end. And for more information on themes and everything, it's in the uh, Interreg Northwest Europe uh, program document. And we have also drafted some nice summary fact sheets for you to have information on that. Sarine Alexandre, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. And um, after the video, we will have a short quiz.